And tonight we have Matt Ringman, an author in Pursuit of Giants. Um, and he's going to be talking about um, <coughs> his book and <laughs> um, in the ways that we can help um, kind of try to conserve, conserve the planet, conserve the three of the largest fish in the ocean, blue marlin, tuna, <coughs> and the swordfish. And, um, I also just wanted to mention a couple of the other things that are coming up. This coming Saturday, um, we're having Michael Tubis, uh, who will be here. We're not sure if we're going to be having him in the town hall or here, but it will be at 11 o'clock um, before a storm too soon. And uh, on Monday, October 28th, we'll be having the Gravestone Girls, and they'll be doing, uh, telling us about the gravestones in Groveland. Are these the ones that were here last year? Not last year, but maybe a few years ago. Not last year. But, um, and they, they'll bring some of their jewelry that they kind of make from the, the gravestone etchings as well. Um, and then I also wanted to just mention that for the River Pines Book Club, on October 30th, they are doing the 18 best stories from Edgar Allan Poe. So, if you're a big Poe <coughs> fan, 2 o'clock on the October 30th, that will be a good day to go. Where do they meet? Where do they meet? Where, they, yeah. they meet at River Pines in their community room. So, uh, <coughs> so now, I'd just like you to enjoy Matt Rigney. And his book is actually um, one of, it was one of the finalists for the Mass Book Awards. It's one of the must-reads, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, you know, this story began, really, about 46 years ago. Um, when I started fishing, uh, my family, my father isn't very much of a fisherman, but my great-grandfather was a really great fisherman. He fished on Long Island Sound. Um, and if you could advance it one there, Diana. That's me at the age of four being taught by my father to fish. It's probably one of the first times I ever went out. Um, and from that point on, I was always just enthralled by the fact that beneath the level of the water, there really is another planet. It's a different existence than we could ever possibly imagine. These are animals that breathe water, essentially. Um, and they do things that look differently than, than we know anything on land. So I was enth really enthralled at that point, and um, it just began this long engagement that I have with fishing. So I would go by myself a lot. I would go uh, with friends. Much of the reason I went was because of my great-grandfather um, who's in the next picture. This is um, him featured in 1953 or 54, I think. That's a 69-pound bass, striped bass, caught off of um, the Elizabeth Island, specifically Cuddyhunk. Um, so really not that far from here. And he, he was catching 50-pound striped bass routinely. Pretty much every year he'd get one at least that size. You know, if we catch... If somebody catches a 40-inch striped bass, 45-inch striped bass, that's a big deal these days. He was catching those size pretty frequently. And what I realized as I grew up, um, really my late teens, early 20s, and then as I really started fishing intensively through my late 20s, I realized that I just could never match what he was able to do. I was never able to find those fish. I was never able to get things nearly as big as his were. And I thought to myself, why? Why is this? I have no idea why, you know, maybe things have changed a little bit or whatever, but I didn't really know um, until I read this. This is the March 2007 edition of National Geographic, and the whole series of articles they did were called Saving the Sea's Bounty. And it covered three things, the bluefin tuna, what was happening to this great fish in the Mediterranean, um, 
what New Zealand has done to establish marine reserves, and then the story of the Grand Banks cod and what happened to the fishing villages up in Newfoundland as a result of the collapse of that stock. Now the cod up there, as we probably all want to know because it's really our, our next door neighbors up there, that, that body of cod offshore is one of the richest, most intense aggregations of life in the ocean this planet's ever known. The tonnages of cod up there um, really are stunning. When you look historically, going back 50, 100, 200 years, um, it's, a, it's a teeming amount of life that we have a hard time, especially now today, we have a hard time imagining because basically we've never seen it. This, this is a report that was cited in the National Geographic articles, and it basically says this. In your Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans, the three largest oceans on the planet, and going from tropical to subtropical and temperate zones within those oceans, the decline is consistent when you look back 50 years going to 1950. The, the amount of fish they were catching versus what we are catching 50 years later. It's consistent, was consistent through every ocean. Now the report by Myers and Worm from Dalhousie University up in Halifax is, you know, there was a lot of peer review. Um, there were people who disputed certain parts of it. But it's clear that between 70 and 90 percent of the largest fish in the ocean <coughs> are gone as compared to what only 50 years ago. Now the interesting thing is that since this, since this paper was put out there, what they found is that our baseline, this baseline in 1950, if you look at the trajectory, it doesn't just flatline. This goes up. So going back in time, we don't really have a baseline for what the oceans used to look like. We have to start to draw from different, different materials. Captain's logs. Um, there's a great book called The Mortal Sea, which just won this year's um, history prize, the greatest history prize in the United States is awarded to the Mortal Sea. He's a professor up at UNH, right outside of Portsmouth in Dover. And he talks about the Gulf of Maine, cod catches going back 200, 250 years ago. And he says that the amount of life out there in the ocean was just stunning. We can't imagine it. So if we think we've lost 70 to 90 percent compared to 1950, it's more like we've lost 95%. And there were scientists from UNH who told me we've lost between 97 and 99% of all fin fish and bivalve mollusks in the Gulf of Maine compared to 100 to 150 years ago. Okay, that is a stunning figure. I was just fishing this weekend up in Maine, um, you know, anywhere from a mile to three miles offshore. And those are waters where traditionally, if, if things were a rich, balanced ecosystem, I should be able to put a line down and get anything on the bottom. Halibut, this big, you know, cod, three, four, five feet long, um, and a number of other types of fish. It's fascinating because one of the, I mean, I'm reading all this stuff all the time. Another book I'm reading is called The Swordfish Hunters. It's by a professor of mine from College of the Bates. He's researching this um, obscure community of Native American people called the Red Paint People from 4,000 years ago in the Gulf of Maine. They were harpooning 500 to 1,000 pound swordfish within 20 miles ashore. Okay. Those, are, those are rare, if not impossible, to find <coughs> up there. So the ocean as we know it is radically different now than it used to be only 50 years ago. And this gives you an example. This is, this is 100 years ago. This is 1900 compared to 99 years later. Um, what we're looking at here is color gradations based on the tons of fish per square kilometer. Now, a kilometer is only six tenths of a mile. It's not even a square mile. So roughly just a little larger than half mile squares. The red area, which is basically from South Carolina all the way up past Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, up into the Grand Banks. We're talking thousands of square miles of territory. You, were, you would be able to find 10 or more tons of fish per square half mile. Okay. And now if you look up here, it's down to anywhere from three, 
to four or less tons in the same area. So there's been an enormous decline. And so after reading those National Geographic articles, I said to myself, if, if there's anything that I can contribute to, to this problem in terms of helping people understand or turning the tide or motivating people to be inspired to see that there's a chance to, to do something here and save this, I thought I've got to do it. And what I came up with was this idea of not, not going over all these facts in this book, but basically taking the reader offshore with me. Most people have never been beyond a mile, a mile or two offshore. Okay, it is 70% of the world is water. And I know what's out there, and I wanted to bring people out there to see it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you through some of what I found, some of the causes of why this decline has happened, and then I'm going to read you some passages from the book that kind of put you on the boats with me. Because I went, went all over the world to try to encounter these fish. Okay, so where I went was I went to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, at the bottom of the Baja Peninsula. I went up to the northeast peak of George's Bank, about 100 miles south of the southern tip of Nova Scotia. I went to Malta in the Mediterranean to cover the bluefin tuna trade there. I went to South Australia, um, New Zealand, northern Australia, and then Japan. And all of it was in pursuit of three main types of fish. This one, which is a marlin. This specifically is a black marlin. Now how, how big do you think that fish is? Anyone looking at it? Six feet. Six feet? That fish is nine feet long. Wow. It's 600 pounds, 650 pounds actually. And it hit a 38 pound tuna for bait. Oh. It's a live tuna. Oh, wow. So a 38 pound tuna is about that big. Wow. The ratio that they talk about is that a fish of that size, when it really opens its mouth, can take in one-tenth of its body weight. So that's like me opening and eating a 23-pound hamburger. <laughs> okay. The next one is my personal favorite, the swordfish. Um, this is a fish, you know, a lot of us, we, we've eaten swordfish or seen in the market. Um, those of us who know some of the kinds of fish that are offshore of New England. We think mostly of bluefin tuna. They're sort of the, the Cadillac species, if you will. Very expensive. Um, uh, they bring a high price in market. They're terribly powerful. They're incredible animals. But the swordfish to me, and I'll, I'll read you some sections that talk about why, the swordfish is just the king of all the great fish as far as I'm concerned because it's the only fish that I know of that will, that actually seems to be thinking about what's going on um, when it's fighting an angler. I've never hooked one or caught one myself, but I've seen them. Um, and there are some sections in the book, especially at the end, where I talk about what I saw in swordfish off in New Zealand. We were 200 miles out with a guy who was trying to set a world record. And the fish that I saw did things I never thought a fish could do. Um, the last one that we cover is the bluefin tuna. Now, the bluefin is, there was a world record set this past year for a fish sold in the Skiji market in Tokyo. Um, it fetched over, over $700,000 for a fish that was just under 600 pounds, wow. one fish. Wow. So this animal you see here is a 900 pound animal. All right, this photograph, and then the next two you're gonna see afterward. This photograph was taken off a no man's land island which, for those of you who know the Elizabeth Group, right near Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. no man's land is a little chunk of land out there. And uh, the guy that got this photograph was fishing for them. His brother was fishing. This was not a hooked fish. And they saw this fish come up after an Atlantic bluefish. So this right here is the bluefish trying to get away. So that 900 pound animal is nine feet long. Okay, if it was, if it was right here in front of you, It'd be from this table, maybe over to about here, and its back would be this tall. Wow. Okay, most of its body would be forward, all of its weight is forward, and then it has this long, graceful tail, ending in a in a caudal peduncle. They call it, or the caudal peduncle is a knuckle on which the tail moves. But the tail itself would be probably three feet tall, and it can beat so fast that you can't see it with your eyes, making rotation so quickly, it's like a propeller. 
it, it just blasts. So if you see the next picture, you can see the animal chasing after it. And then if you, if what you're looking at is actually the underside of the fish. This is its chin, right? So imagine this. This is a 900-pound fish. It can keep up with your car on the highway. 60 miles an hour through water. Okay, water is 780 times as dense as air. I found a, I found a calculation of the power that bluefin tuna generate. And this animal alone produced something at top speed, something like 38 or 40 horsepower, just this one animal. So what I try to do in this book is I try to expose people to these things as creatures, as animals, not as food. Not that they aren't food, but we have to think of them differently, I think, if we're going to try to conserve them. So what I found in my travels is that there's you know, the types of gear that have impacted the ocean are mainly three types. This set is called the long line, okay? You have a main line, and then off of it, little branches with hooks on them and bait. Now, there are now regulations in the United States specifically around long line, but there are not regulations in the open ocean, and a lot of other countries don't have regulations for long line. Some people will set up to 75 miles of this stuff one shot and they'll leave it out for a day come back 24 hours later 36 hours later and what they'll find is yeah they caught what they wanted you know they might have caught a brown fish or something that came up if it was in shallow water or they get something at the surface but they'll also catch what they didn't even intend to catch definition of open ocean is international is beyond that 12 mile thing what's no. open ocean open ocean um open ocean or the pelagic realm is basically refers to the realm where the bottom is a different ecosystem. You're in open oh, right. water where there's no islands, there's no nothing. Okay, nothing it's to do with just legal water. fishing. Or does it have anything to do with legal fishing? Um, do you know what I mean? Like international versus there's there's the high seas. That's the ungov basically the okay, ungoverned I, I, area. I see, I see. Every country has a two hundred mile, used to be a twelve mile before that was a three mile. EEZ, an exclusive economic zone, but now it's a 200 mile zone that goes offshore of any country, and that's their exclusive territory. They can do whatever they want in there. Um, so, the problem with long lighting is you get things that you don't intend to catch sharks, 100 million sharks die every year. You get leatherback and loggerhead and other types of massive sea turtles, which are in decline. You get, in some cases, seabirds, you get seals. You get know, all sorts of stuff you don't intend to catch. There are ways to mitigate the bycatch, as it's called, the stuff you don't intend to catch. You can put streamers on to, you know, warn the birds off. Um, you can do shorter, shorter lines and quicker turnarounds. So when if you get something on there, like a marlin that you don't intend to catch, or a sailfish, you can unhook it, and if it's in decent enough shape, it'll survive. Okay, you can also vary the type of hook you use. But the end, the bottom result is, in indiscriminate long lining, it damages ecosystems. The North Atlantic is not the same as it used to be because of long lining. And I talk about why that is in the book. So here's an example of bycatch, some turtles that were caught. Tons of sharks. Like I said, 100 million of them a year. These are. These are rates of death that they c simply cannot sustain. Sharks are very slow, slow to reproduce. And so this, this picture shows that basically for every pound of fish that you catch, that you eat rather, that has been caught on long line, you can basically assume that there's a, you know, some portion of weight of other species that goes into supplying you with that pound of fish. The other, one of the other methods is called the purse saner. Purse saning is, um, especially with our technology now when we can look down from space and look at where the warm water is, we can use, you know, echo sounders on boats that are so sophisticated, you know, we can even pick up stuff off the sides. Um, and we have ships that are, that are capable of 
harvesting tens of tons of these animals at one shot. So for example, in the Mediterranean, you get one of these super saners, as they're called, a new breed of, of sane boat. It's look, look, linked into every kind of technology. They can look over the whole Mediterranean and know where the warm water is, know where these fish are going to be. They can go and they can take an entire school of adults, 3,000 adult bluefin tuna in one shot. Okay? Doesn't leave, I mean, this is even before they're spawning. Okay, so you've just taken out that entire group of fish from being able to contribute to the stock um, for the next generation. And so what the, the other twist on purse saving is that they developed this technology in South Australia where they net the fish, transfer them to these towable pens, okay, tow them back to shore, and then for six to eight months, they fatten the fish. So if you started with a 300-pound tuna, say 1,000 300-pound tunas, instead of just killing them and shipping them to Tokyo, what you do is you fatten them by 100 pounds. So now you have a 1,000 400-pound tuna, and that's what you ship off to Tokyo you know, six months later. And of yeah, course, it's um, right. I it's not the same as aquaculture. It's not the same as yeah. like salmon farms, right, right? But it's similar. It's called ranching, tuna ranching. Okay. You know, but so it's it's yeah. some of it's the same idea. They're not fish that you're propagating yourself. Right. Although people are trying to do that. Okay. This is something we'd be familiar with in New England because it's the bottom trawl. You know, most of the shores off of New England, especially. Gulf of Maine are maybe four or five, six hundred feet deep. Okay, they're within range of the bottom trawl. This is incredibly destructive. You have big ship cables coming down. It doesn't even have to be a big ship. It could be 40 feet. You have a huge net with rollers on the bottom and weights, and then these giant steel doors. What it does is it just plows over the bottom. And what they what they found is that what it does is it, you don't just catch the fish, you destroy everything. There's a, there should be a soft bottom layer of, you know, corals and sponges and all this actually three-dimensional territory that fish can lay their eggs in, hide in, the young can survive there. There's invertebrates like worms and stuff that live in that, that soil structure. So what you see is in this, uh, <coughs> this is the before bottom trawling. You can see the three-dimensional structure, corals and uh, soft sponges, the fish. And then afterwards, this thing comes through like a bulldozer and just plows it all over. It, some of this, this gear is so powerful it'll move boulders the size of cars. Um, so, you know, and it just destroys what's on the bottom. That bottom is not just a flat terrain, it's, it's habitat. So the result of all this kind of gear in the last 50 to 100 years is that when we began, you have a, a diverse ecosystem. You've got a lot of different types of fish, a lot of different sizes and generations of fish. You have bottom habitat and bottom creatures, all this stuff that gets eaten or eats other things. And then as you fish heavily, you basically, nothing is left on the bottom. You go from huge numbers of fish to diminished numbers per stock. And in some cases, certain stocks don't continue. Like up in the Grand Banks, those cod have been laid off for, you know, going on 15, 20 years at this point. People have not been heavily fishing them, and they haven't come back. And one of the, one of the reasons they suspect is because the niche that was occupied by cod has been occupied now by something else. So the balance is off. And there's ways that the balance can be thrown off that it can't come back. So what I'd like to do now is, is to take you offshore to two locations. The first location is basically um, right next door to us. We're right here now in this area. Okay. So if you go out, if you were to, were to go out to Gloucester, right? This location where I went, the Northeast Channel. The Northeast Peak is called, right here. Northeast Peak of George's Bank is 100 miles south of Cape Sable. I went out with some fishermen there. And we were out there to 
they were harpooning swordfish. Now, the reason I wanted to cover harpooning is because it's a single fish method. You, you stick one fish at a time. You're not accidentally sticking a shark. You're not accidentally you know, killing 50 other types of fish in addition to what the one you want. Harpooning, like I said, goes back in the Gulf of Maine to the red paint people who were living in mid-coast Maine 4,000 years ago. Okay, so harpooning is a very old method. They were the only ones to practice it back then. And then it was picked up again much, much, much later. And now we still practice it. We still have boats going out from, you know, the Cape Cod area, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, there's some, there's a couple I know that are trying to go out from Kennebunk Port. Um, but these guys, there's a few communities in the south, southern part of Nova Scotia that are still practicing it. And the only other harpooners I know for swordfish is a small group of guys that out around uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, <coughs> that area. Okay. So the way they do it kind of looks old fashioned. You know, you have a boat, and off the bow of the boat, you have this catwalk, basically. It's called the stand. It's, you know, 15, 18, 20 feet long. There's a little pulpit, it's called, at the end. And then from the center of the boat, you have this main mast where you have a steering station. Everybody's looking for fins and then up, up top you have a high station. So what these guys are doing, we're out there looking for swordfish. Now this is a, this is a day where it looks like it might be pretty easy to see something. The ideal day is when it's glass flat. And that's very rare. It's called the slicker. Very rare in the summer to see something like this. This is an, also an extremely calm day. The days I was out there we were in eight foot seas. So what you're looking for in all this chop and surface texture are two little fins. It's the dorsal fin and the tail fin of the swordfish. It looks like an overturned um, surfboard. You know, the little skegs coming off the surfboard. Um, and so what, we'll, what the harpooner will do, he'll go out to the end of the stand, and you'll see, you'll see this is Dwayne the harpooner of the boat I was on. If you look up here, you can see the swordfish. Okay, he's under the water. He hasn't even broken the surface. And this electric purple color that these swordfish are in the wild is unlike anything you've ever seen. It's this blue purple color, and it absolutely lights up from inside. It's just this incredible looking fish, and they are so freaking fast. This fish, he took a shot at it. I thought he hit it right in the dorsal, right? And at the last minute, it just kind of bent and just was gone. Mm -hmm. So it looks like he hit it, but, it, but he didn't. Um, <coughs> so that's Dwayne showing me that we got four fish for that day. This is Gabby, uh, the father of the captain, Saul. Um, Gabby had been, you know, at that age, he was, at that point, he was about 70 years old. He'd been fishing since he was under 10. He'd been out there every year harpooning swordfish for as long as he can remember. They all, these guys also lobster, they, they go after halibut, they do all sorts of different stuff. And then this is Saul, the captain. So you'll meet all of these guys in this scene I'm going to read to you from the wheelhouse of this boat <coughs> called Brittany and Brothers. <clears throat> so I went, went out with them for a week um, back in, I think it was 2008. Um, it was in late June. And just then, you know, the weather way out in the Atlantic is starting to get a little bit better. It's, it's still very cold out there. Um, but we did get some nice warm days while we were there. Evening of the first day comes with a slow darkening of the cloud cover from gray to Prussian blue. The gap of sky at the horizon shifting from pink to hot orange until the sun passes by the crack like the molten eye of a god peering under the lid of the world. When it's gone, an indigo dark settles over us. The waves move black and spiked, their crests furred and white, barely visible, and the wind thrums the steel wires overhead. The aroma of boiled potatoes, fried pork chops, and canned peas greets us from the cut entrance as we step into the wheelhouse. Gabby smokes at the wheel, his face illuminated <coughs> by the small yellow binnacle light, the cool blue glow of the navigation screen and the faint lime haze of the overhead radar. We sit on stools against the back wall and face forward, looking out dark windows. The diesel drums evenly beneath our feet. We will drift for a few hours, 
then make our way back to position, then drift again, repeating the pattern through the night. This is the best part of the day, you ask me, Dwayne says, as Saul starts handing up plates of food. You've done your work and now all you got to do is fill your belly and have a yarn and get some sleep. It's not a bad way to live. So what do you think of them swordfish out there today, Maddie? Saul asks. They got a hell of a big wheel on the ass end, don't they? I had no idea, I reply, and then ask something that has been puzzling me. Do you normally see more sharks? Used to. I was surprised we didn't see any today. What kind do you normally see? Oh, all sorts. Poor beagle, white tip, blue dog, tiger sharks. Dozen of them. But it's been how many years, would you say now, Gab, since we've seen any good numbers? Now, Gabby, his father, is, his whole shtick was that he was a crotchety, just mean old man, and the fact is he wasn't, but he had this whole persona that he kept up. Hell if I know, Gabby says, 10 or 12 at least. You used to see more of the sharks than swordfish. There was a hell of a lot of sharks out here, but you can't long line like those guys do and expect there to be anything left. Dwayne spears a piece of pork chop and says, I've been on them long liners. What's it like, I ask? You get bycatch, that's true. Some of it you let go and hope it lives. Depending on how you do it, some of it will. But it can get pretty bad, pretty messy. He pauses and I sense his reluctance to talk about it. I've seen a lot of sharks come in, and tuna, the big blue fins. I've seen them turtles, green ones, and the big leatherbacks. Those things can get huge. We got one must have been 900 pounds. And Saul says, I know a guy went long lining and they hauled up a porpoise. He said that thing cried like a baby. Just cried like a baby on deck until they killed it. They had to. It wasn't going to make it. They did it. That did it for him. He said it right there. Forget it. I'm done. I ain't never doing this again. And he didn't. <clears throat> that was his first trip and his last. Now the same guy has a lot of long line quota for swordfish, but he won't fish it with long line. He uses the quota, but he harpoons on it. It might take longer, but it's cleaner, and he figures it's better to sleep at night. Saul says, one of these fellows out here tells a story of a swordfish he stuck. Went back a few hours later, tried to pull up the line, and couldn't. Could not budge that thing. Said it was like he, hooked to the, he was hooked to the bottom of the ocean. He leaves the line and goes out after more swords, then comes back an hour later. Still can't budge the damn thing. He has no idea what's going on. He goes out again and finally comes back three, four hours after he harpooned the fish. And he pulls out of the line and he can haul it. That swordfish comes up, nothing but bones and a head just a skeleton. He said it was picked as clean as if it had been done by a bunch of ants. What was it, I ask? What do you think, he says. I puzzle this. Couldn't have been a shark. Saul laughs and finally tells me. Giant squid. That's the only thing could have done it. You know sharks, they're sloppy eaters. None of them tooth whales could have done it either. They would have torn it all to hell. Giant squid, though, they got that beak, they'll just pick it clean. He figures it come up from down deep and sucked onto that swordfish and refused to let go. That's why it was dead weight. 300 pounds of meat off that swordfish in a couple of hours. That must have been some monster squid. From the corner, from within a dim haze of smoke, Gabby says, there's things down there that's scarier than your worst nightmares. There's things nobody's ever think, seen, things you can't imagine. But I, loved, I loved being with these guys because they were... This is what they, they've done this for decades. Between all of them, they probably had over 100 years on the water. Um, and they'd seen things, and um, it's just, they showed me a world I had never seen before. I saw one of the three remaining right whales when I was out there with them. Huge animal, there's only 300 or so left. Um, we saw different kinds of sharks, we saw whales right up close. Um, but they also told me just some really heartbreaking stories about what it used to be like only 20 years, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but it was a lesson. I mean, they could easily go in a different direction. They could easily long line or do something else. But they, they purposely make the choice not to do that. So I respected them for that. So if you go to the store and you see swordfish for sale, I know uh, Whole Foods Market, for example, there's a period of the year, usually June, July, when they offer harpoon-caught swordfish. Okay, so it's selective. You can depend on the fact that it's clean, um, and Whole Foods does a good job of, you know, making sure that it's coming from the source that it says it's coming from. So, this scene, you know, 
with an animal like a swordfish, I think it's got to be the, just the, the predominant species in the ocean for its type. Okay? What, what just really amazes me about this <coughs> animal are its physiological adaptations. Right? Its body is heated. It's one of the few, I mean, marlin and tuna also have the ability to heat their bodies um, through this blood exchange system. But the swordfish fish is deeper than any of them. They've seen swordfish down 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet hunting. There was, um, you know, the Alvin submersible. Some of you might have heard of that. The Alvin went down one time, and they were over 2,000 feet deep. And they hear this whack right into the side of the thing, and they thought, oh, my God. They brought it up, and there was a swordfish that had speared the Alvin, shoved its uh, sword through one of the... Uh, where the hatch closes, the seal right there, had jammed it in there, died, and they ate it for dinner that night. <laughs> but they were down over 2,000 feet, this animal was down there. So, a couple of things. Its eye <coughs> is one of the most developed in the animal kingdom. It literally, the fish that I saw, and these were relatively small fish, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, its eye was a size almost of a baseball. Um, it's got a giant pupil. And the optic nerve that comes from the eye is as big as my pinky. You know, ours is like, you know, very small little pencil nut or something. These things are made to see in the dark. And they're also built for speed. When you look at a swordfish, their stomach is maybe, the entire contents of their gut is maybe in a small cavity of big. The rest is muscle. Every ounce of these things is muscle. And they're shaped not like most fish in this kind of land form, flat. They're shaped as a barrel. They're just round and just stacked with muscle to the extent that when they go through the water, it was recently discovered only a few years ago by a uh, scientist in the Netherlands, it has this network of ducts at the front of its head in this area where it scoops up, right here. What they found is that when the swordfish goes faster through the water, that scoop produces a low pressure area and it extracts oil from those glands so it bathes its head. So it goes faster through the water. I mean, it's absolutely stunning how much these things are built for their environment. And their number one uh, predator, nemesis really, is the mako shark. What I'd like to read you now is um, a little bit more about the swordfish. This comes from um, this, this experience I had off of New Zealand with this guy, John Gregory, who runs this boat called Primetime. Um, I really have no doubt that this guy probably is the greatest swordfish captain that has ever lived. He has landed more 500 pound greater swordfish than anyone alive, probably anyone in history. Um, I got to go with him. So I'll read you a short section from him. Um, so this, he says, we're out on his boat, if you can advance there, Diana. This is his boat, prime time, it's 58 feet long. He takes his clients out 200 miles, 250 miles, and often the northern part of New Zealand, that's in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody out there, there's no help if you get into trouble, he is out there alone. And I would, would never go that far with any boat but this guy. He did everything by the book. There was a day, there's a teak stairway that comes back down here, this day he came down the stairway and he saw this little chunk out of the teak. I mean, the boat's six years old. It's seen some of the heaviest action you can see, and it looks brand new. And he walked down the step and he said to his mate, what happened? Like, what happened? Why is that piece of wood missing from my stairway? Um, so he's that kind of captain, exactly the kind of guy you want to be with. And that's him. So John recalls a video shot by a commercial fisherman of two massive tiger sharks attacking a broadbill swordfish on the surface. The tigers had taken its tail off, which is typically what any shark species that attacks a swordfish will do. The first thing is it takes off its speed, <coughs> cut its ability to move, and then it's, then it's a sitting duck, basically. The tigers had taken its tail off, and then one of them made the mistake of coming at the swordfish from the front. That fish opened the shark up from front to back with one massive swipe of its sword and sent it, according to John, a bleeding, screaming mess to the bottom. The other shark decided it was no longer interested in the swordfish and moved off. Another of John's stories concerned a massive swordfish caught on a long line. 
The fishermen took the section of main line with the fish on it and attached it to a separate fighting line so that they could bring the rest of the long line sections in while they tried to land the fish. They wrapped the fighting line, a rope with a breaking strength of 800 pounds, around a hydraulic capstan, the mechanism used to raise the anchors on a ship. Even with the aid of the capstan, it took five hours to bring the fish to the boat. When they brought it up out of the darkness into the light cast by the ship, the fish was gargantuan. By some estimates, over a thousand kilos. Now, a kilo is 2.2 pounds, so they were looking at a fish that was over 2,000 pounds. The fish promptly broke the line. John has seen swordfish bills, that's just the sword part, that was over six feet long. I've seen monsters come up in the nets when I was commercial fishing, he says. Swordfish definitely go over 850 kilos. One of the largest I've seen was 524 kilos, and that was trunked. This fish was 30 pounds shy of the all-tackle world record, without its head, tail, fins, and guts. Swordfish are distinctive not only for their size and strength, but for their ferocity and courage, their willingness to turn on an aggressor. On one trip, John and his crew had a 650-pound swordfish on the leader in five minutes and swiftly swung two gaps into it. Mike, the mate, opened the transom door, which is at the back of the boat. And the fish, unbeknownst to them, turned and propelled itself into the boat, came into the cockpit area at the back of the boat. It was a 650-pound fish. This was a mistake, recalls John. The fish was totally green, and when it touched the deck, it went absolutely berserk. Its tail smashed in the teak and aluminum bait hatches on the cockpit floor, just punched them in. The fish got its sword under the fighting chair and proceeded to break the welds. It broke free and swung wildly, the sword like a machine scythe, slicing back and forth on deck, cutting into the fiberglass gunnels. The crew and clients fled the cockpit area, some running up the stairway to the flybridge, others into the main cabin. After tearing the place to pieces, the fish ran its sword clear through a large, insulated, custom-made fiberglass storage cooler, easily 125 pounds in weight, and thrashed around with the cooler impaled on its sword until the front part of its face tore off and it died right there on deck. It was on the leader in five, on the boat in six, and dead in 14 minutes, recalls Mike. It was eight minutes of bedlam. That fish, 300 kilos, mind you, nearly threw itself off the boat. It was jumping three feet off the deck. John tells me in those few short moments it did $25,000 worth of damage to the cockpit. It was sobering to see. They are absolutely fearless. I had one come up alongside prime time, which is nearly 60 feet long, and lift its head out of the water and smash the side of the boat with its sword. It inflicted several thousand dollars worth of damage to the air intake. Their power and agility is unparalleled. Marlin are pussycats by comparison. They're just Christmas trees. So, I hope that conveys, I mean, that's another person's story. There's other stories that I experienced in here when I actually saw these things in action. Um, they really deserve our respect. I mean, I don't have a problem with um, eating animals. Personally, I think that's how our species has always survived. And I don't have a problem with fishing, as long as it's done correctly, whether it's commercial fishing or sport fishing. Um, people sometimes ask me, how can you, after you've done and seen all this, how can you continue to fish? Um, I would never have done this book. I would never have felt as passionately as I do about this if I had not spent days and days out on the water watching that world and knowing why it needs to be preserved. So, um, you know, for more information, you can go to my website, which is inpursuitofgiants.com. Um, I've got articles on Huffington Post about fishing, especially cod in New England and bluefin tuna. Um, but that's the message I want to leave with people, is that it, there's a whole world out there to be explored. I would encourage any of you who've never even gone on a whale watch, take the opportunity. Because if you, if you luck out and you get a good day, you'll see things you've never seen before. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? What happened yeah. to the catch of what fish should have As a rule. Yeah, as a rule. You know, sport fishing, I really have to give the, the practice credit. Because sport fishermen are, most, are among the most adaptable. Um, and responsible groups that I know. I mean, the catch and re release mm -hmm. ethic didn't exist 25, 30 years ago. 
okay, and suddenly it kind of came into vogue, and now everybody catches and releases fish. It just doesn't matter of practice. If you don't want to eat it, don't keep it. And even the notion of meeting your limit, let's say, you know, the state regulations say that you can keep, you know, 15 bluefish in a day. I encourage people to just keep what you can eat without even putting it in the freezer. I mean, most frozen fish degrades in quality pretty quickly, in my opinion. So eat only what you can. Don't catch 15 bluefish because that's your limit. It doesn't mean you're a better fisherman. I mean, bluefish will hit, you know, a penny if you throw it out to them or hit it. So it's that sort of thing. Like, I think it's a, they're actually quite a responsible group. So most people that I know, if they're not fishing for their dinner, they throw it back. And there are ways to do it. There are ways to fish for them where you actually really limit the, the type of pain or even damage that you do to the fish. You use circle hooks, <coughs> that kind of stuff, and um, you, know, you avoid a lot of the damage. You hear a lot in the paper of the uh, Gloucester fishermen, mm -hmm. and you know they're all upset that the government is setting. Uh, so a lot of them are going to have to go out of business, well, right. because the, if they don't, they continue catching fish. Of course, we're not going to bring them back. What are your thoughts to that? I mean, you yeah. want the government to pay them for not fishing, like our farmers, I guess. Mm -hmm. I actually, I wrote a piece for the Boston Globe online editorial page about that when the issue started really flaring up earlier this year. The problem is the cod off of New England are decimated. Okay. We have to stop fishing off New England, if you ask me, or fish extremely minimally and stop using damaging techniques like the trawl. I mean, we have to, we have to take the long view. I guarantee there's not a politician out there who has the courage to say, I'm sorry guys, but listen, we have to take the long view. If you, you're out of luck right now, but if you want your kid to have a shot at this, or maybe even your grandkid, we're talking 20 to 30 years where we need to just lay off. That's the answer. What happened in, with cod in New England is that they set aside these reserve areas, okay, because they were so hammered, they, had, they wanted to see if just stopping fishing would bring them back, okay? They're starting to show signs of coming back. The rest of the areas where guys are allowed to fish are in terrible shape. So the guys will say, we go out there, we can catch the fish. The fact is, cod fishermen in New England have not met their quota for the last three years, despite their efforts. They can't find the fish because they're not there. So what the position I took in this editorial was, we need to shut that down. I don't have a problem with the government compensating guys, buying them out. I would like to see you know, the number of boats in the fishery and the number of people fishing reduced. You know, <coughs> just like any business, you know, if, if my, you know, I write books only part of the time, I got other day jobs, you know, and if I don't do those jobs well enough or if the industry changes, I mean, books have changed radically. No one's paying me to go get another, another livelihood. People have to do it. You know, things shift. The ocean is not what it used to be. So their answer was, let us go into the reserve areas to fish those. And I guarantee you let them in there for a year with the trawl, it's done for 10, done for five or 10. So I'm absolutely not, I'm not in favor of that. Um, it's not the government imposing limits, it's, it's nature. They've tried to catch the fish, they're not there. And so I think it's nature imposing the limits, saying like, you know, you take too many, they're, they're, not, gonna, they're not gonna be there, you need to let them come back. So that's, that's my position on it. What kind of day work do you do, other than uh, I, yeah, you know, I do uh, I do a combination of stuff related to communication. So I write grants, I run programs, mostly in education. Um, I do video scripts and manage video projects. Stuff teaching like at all? No teaching. No. Only this. It's only for. Um, aside from, like, as individuals making more responsible seafood choices of what we decide to eat or not eat, yeah. um, what other resources or what other things do you suggest people can do to try and, you know, reduce bycatch and all these yeah. issues? So that's a great question. At the back of the book, I wanted to give people basically a small manual on what to do. So mm -hmm. I try to address everything. Mm -hmm. If you're a consumer, <coughs> if you're a sports fisherman, if you want to get really into it and start thinking about the political angle. There are all sorts of ways to get involved, and I talk about those at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. the, um, what I tell people if they're a consumer is, you know, 
when you go to a fish market, ask your fishmonger, not only, you know, is this sustainable or not? I mean, people's definition of what sustainable is is radically different. Ask them where it was caught and how it was caught. Guaranteed they will not be able to answer you. Okay, in most cases. It's, a, those are, it's really tough to trace um, or track the entire stream of delivery for how fish get to market. But those are important questions, and if more people begin asking that, then they will have the information. We get this from these fishermen in this location using this method. Okay, So that's the most responsible way that I can think of doing it because it applies the right kind of pressure back through the system. Um, other than that, I mean, I, I pick and choose. Like, I just don't eat cod. I don't eat swordfish. I will never eat a bluefin tuna. I mean, those poor things are down to 1% to 3% of their their breeding population, there's not a, you know, they're in really bad shape. Um, and actually, being politically active is very easy. There's, there's stuff you can do that impacts New England waters directly. Um, if you go and find the Marine Fish Conservation Network or a number of the other ones I list in the book, they will send you, via email, these periodic action alerts where they need you to maybe call your state representative or, um, you know, sign a petition and send it. People think that doesn't have an effect. It has a huge effect. Herring in the Gulf of Maine, for example, they used to be caught all summer long. Then, because of, you know, popular demand, people saying, no, you need to wait until everything else has had a chance to feed through the summer. You know, bluefin tuna and striped bass and the rest of them. And then in the fall, you can get up there with your nets and, and harvest them. It's a great solution, okay? Um, we had, there were over 50,000 people commented on herring regulations, okay, from New England last year. I mean, it makes a huge difference. So just those little pieces, you know, uh, the letters are usually typically very clearly explained. It's clear what needs to happen. And so, so there's all sorts of stuff that you can do that actually does have an impact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you selling your book? I am. I'm selling books here. I